I'm not in any way saying that the Bible is ludicrous, but why should we base the contextual evidence that it presents any different than the contextual evidence off of a Dr. Seuss book or John Steinbeck's uh, Grapes of Wrath? It's just context. It, we don't know it really happened. Okay, great question. Sir, I am not asking you to accept the Bible as the Word of God. Okay, okay so let's get that straight. Okay? I think it's ridiculous for me to say, well, the Bible's the Word of God. There's no way I could show that, so forget that, okay? What I am asking you to accept is the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as historically reliable. Okay. In other words, I am convinced that the evidence is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are a historical narrative that is reliable. It'll give you an accurate picture of who Jesus was. Okay. Now, is that a problem? Or can you accept that as historically uh, accurate? I don't have enough time to check the like credibility, but I'm sure they're pretty credible from your... Uh, what you're saying, they sound pretty credible. So, how long were they written after the disciples? Yeah. yeah. Great question. The, the gospels were written. The gospels were written within 20 to 60 years after Christ. Which means they were written by eyewitnesses or by those who knew eyewitnesses of Christ. I don't think it's wise of you to trust me. Well, yeah, I just, right? I don't have any direction, so you I'm bet. trying to find which way to go. Okay, I'll, well, thank you for your honesty. I appreciate it and respect that. All right, now just let me share with you how I did it. Okay. And nothing sacred about the way I did it, yeah. but I would plead with you, you got to come up with your own tests that you use to determine whether a document, any document, is historically reliable or not. You've got a history department right there, right? You guys got to pay money to take history courses, so obviously you respect it as a, a branch of knowledge. Okay, here are my four tests that I use on Suetonius, Tacitus, Homer, the Gospels, the Quran, the history of Siddhartha Gautama Buddha, American history, African history, South American history, Chinese history. It's the following, four tests. What is the literary style of the document? You see, what's fascinating is some of you guys don't have the foggiest idea what I'm just said, but you do it unconsciously you do what I just said. What I just said is respect literary style. And some of you are thinking, what? What's that? When you go to biology class, do you read a biology textbook the same way you read the plays of William Shakespeare? Good. That's an example of respecting literary style. You know that science textbook, scientific writing, is not the same as a play by William Shakespeare. Do you read a play of William Shakespeare the same way you would read a poem? Nope. Do you read a poem the same way you would read a math textbook? Nope. Okay, that all that's what that is. You're respecting literary style. So, you obviously have to learn what is the literary style of historical narrative. Historical narrative is concerned with what, such questions as, at what time did this take place? At what place did this take place? And who were the people around to witness this event take place? That's historical narrative. Second test, internal consistency. At 2.24, Thursday, November 1st, Cliff was in San Marcos, Texas. Later on in the document, at 2.24 on November 1st, Cliff was in Calcutta, India. Yeah. Contradiction. The author's mixed up. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You will see there's no contradictions. Are there different perspectives? Yes. <laughs> Tonight, I'm going to call my wife up in Connecticut. I'm going to say, I talked to a very respectful man, a very intelligent man, who had a Texas State shirt on. Later on in the conversation, I'm going to say, I spoke to over 50 people. Is that a contradiction? No. If you would have said at the same instance, then it would have been a contradiction. Well, not even so. Because oh, well, when I was talking with you, oh, 50 people oh, were listening, right? Yes. See, okay. so it's, it's perspective. Yeah. Okay? okay? So you got to keep that one clear in your head when it comes to contradiction. Yeah. Okay, so the first test is literary style. The second test is internal consistency. The third test is archaeology. What does that mean? On November 1st, 2012, Cliff spoke to students on the island of Atlantis. What? 
Where is the island of Atlantis? It's fictitious, right? So, was Jesus born on the island of Atlantis? No, he was born in Bethlehem, grew up in Nazareth, went to Jerusalem, floated a boat, not on the Sea of Orpheus, no, on the Sea of Galilee. Archaeologically verifiable places. Okay, it's a third test to determine whether a historical document is reliable. Here's the fourth test. Now, now catch this one, because some of you guys have already raised this this week, and I'm glad you did, which is, come on, man, you ever playing a game telephone? You sit in a circle, whisper a secret in the ear of the person next to them, they whisper it in the ear of the person next to them, and by the time that secret reaches the end of the circle, it's totally changed. I was going to raise that point. Good. Okay, that's important, isn't it? Yeah. Okay? So th that's the fourth test, manuscript evidence, which is great what this guy raised who just left. Okay. How big is the gap between Jesus living and the written records? Very important question. It used to be taught on every state university campus in the United States, in the religion department, that the Gospels were not written for two, three, four hundred years after Christ. But what happened was we have discovered so many Greek early manuscripts that we know that that's false. The Gospels were not written two, three hundred, four hundred years after Christ. They were all written between two, twenty, and sixty years after Christ. How do we know that? Well, we got a fragment of the Gospel of John, dated between 115 and 130 AD in the John Rylands Museum in Manchester, England. So you see that one manuscript find smashed that whole school of thought that taught the Gospels weren't written for a few hundred years. Then we discovered the writings of the early church fathers, like Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch, who in 95 AD writes letters and in these letters, he quotes Matthew, Mark, Luke. In other words, at 95 AD, those letters were obviously already written because he's quoting him in his letters. See, that's why we know that those Gospels were written in the first century. Now, the Gospels that we have in English today, sir, are based on over 5,200 Greek manuscripts or pieces of manuscript. That is why we have such a high degree of certainty that we really have what those eyewitnesses wrote. If we, the, the Iliad comes closest to it, and the Iliad has something like 600 manuscripts. Yeah. But for the New Testament, over 5,000. So if anybody gives you the old telephone stuff, they just don't know what they're talking about. We don't have the New Testament by telephone from the French and Spanish versions. We have the Greek manuscripts, over 5,000, all agreeing to an infinitesimal degree. So we really have what those guys wrote. You owe it to yourself as a thinking human being. Read the gospel simply as history. Forget about it being the word of God. You don't know that. And ask yourself, does the historical evidence of the way Jesus lived, taught, died, and rose from the dead point to him being a fraud if it does reject him? Or does it point to him being the truth if it does embrace him? Put your faith in it. I just have one more short question. Yeah, uh, go ahead. The other, the other conflict I have is um, I realized a lot of theism, not uh, necessarily, but most of the time, it always uh, is accompanied by afterlife. And the thing I don't understand with that is most humans are scared of 2,400 because they will not be alive. Right. And my uh, interpretation is consciousness wants to maintain itself and the idea of not existing kind of just defeats the purpose. So I always tell my friends, uh, were you scared of 1876 when you didn't exist? And then they'll say no. And then I'll say, why, why would you be scared of 2400? You won't exist. You don't remember it. You're not aware of it. And no one's ever been able to really retort to that. You bet. So I don't, I mean, I've had one person say it's after God builds a relationship with you. But it, I mean, I really haven't found anything that's been solid that kind of made me question it. So. Okay, good. Okay, the reason that I'm not concerned about Cliff in 1876 is because I was not alive then. So you're right, that doesn't matter to me. But since May 20th, 1954, when I was born, sorry to give you an idea of how old I am. <laughs> since then, I have been keenly concerned about Cliff's life. Now, often people say, well, that's just selfishness. 
on your part, Cliff, that you're concerned about your life. No, it is not selfishness. It's an affirmation of the value of my life. Now, if you get really sick, you're going to go to the best doctor you can. Cause you not because you're selfish, but because you affirm the value of your life. Why are you and I not going to go out and play out on traffic on I-35? It's not because we're selfish. Yeah. It's because we don't want to end up on the bumper of a car or a truck because we affirm the value of our life. Our life is good. We don't want to end it by getting crushed by a truck or a car. Okay, why am I interested in you living life after death? Why am I, inter why am I interested in living life after death? Not because I'm selfish, but I celebrate life. I affirm the value of your life and my life. And therefore, if there is life after death, I'm keenly interested in it. If there's no life after death, fine, we've got to face the fact there's no life after death. But because I affirm life, I want to get you to the best doctor possible if you get really sick. And because I affirm the value of your life, I also am keenly interested in you living for eternity in heaven. And to tell you the truth, sir, that, that's what motivates me partially to be out here to talk. Yeah. Because I affirm life. I think you guys are great. I want you to experience eternal life. I'm convinced that Jesus Christ died on a cross for our sins, which leads to death, but he rose from the dead. That's why I trust that him talking about life after death is not just him doing this and blowing smoke. He's speaking the truth. That's why putting our faith in Christ is so important. Does that make any sense? Yeah, that makes sense. It's just I. Uh... I agree with you on a lot of points. It's just whenever we reach to the uh, conclusion, like when we were talking about ethics and society earlier, I agreed with you about all the um, about there being a higher law of order. Right. And it's just our interpretations are a bit different. But we, I mean, me and you are basically been reaching the same conclusion. Uh huh. But I'm I'm like proud to uh, admit we can agree to disagree. So. Absolutely, we can agree to disagree. <laughs> Doesn't mean I'm not going to pray that you put your faith in Christ. I hope that's okay with you. I mean, I'll look into it. I've never heard anyone make uh, the point about Luke and, uh, what was it, Luke, Mark, and... Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, yeah. I didn't know they were that credible, because I've seen so many, uh, there's a lot of floating websites around there that just list each page and how many yeah. fallacies and inconsistencies. Yeah. Yeah. And I always see those, and I never see the parts that say, how many manuscripts was it? Over 5,200. See, I was not aware of that. So you now did. I need to go back and refine. Good, well, I respect you, thank you. Often people say to me, Cliff, it is impossible that your God exists. And I ask why? And they respond, because you believe your God is all powerful. You also believe he's all loving, he's good. But suffering exists. Innocent children die. Innocent people get ripped off. Therefore, your all powerful, all good God cannot exist. Really? You have forgot another option. The option you have forgotten is, the all-powerful God can choose to partially limit His power by creating us with a free will. If God creates us with a free will, it means He's limiting Himself. He is not controlling everything that happens. Instead, He has given us the ability to create, and we can create that which is good, or we can create that which is evil, that leads to suffering. When you read the Bible, you'll notice that indeed God has partially limited his power by giving us a free will. In Genesis, we read that God created Adam and Eve. But in Genesis chapter 3, we read how Adam and Eve rebelled against God. And God comes walking through the Garden of Eden saying, Adam, where are you? What a penetrating question. Adam, where are you? And Adam was running away from God. He was hiding because of his guilt and shame, because he knew he had done wrong. He had rebelled against God. Joshua says to the Jewish people in Je Joshua chapter 24, verse 15, If serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Obviously, God has limited his power by giving us the ability to choose freely. Why will there be a hell? For only one reason, because God respects your free will. And if you and I choose to live our lives separate from him, he will not force us into heaven, dragging us by the scruff of the neck. Instead, heaven is eternity living with God. And if we choose to live our lives separate from God, he's not gonna drag us into heaven against our will. 
Yes, indeed, God has chosen to partially limit His power by creating us with a free will. That is why there is evil, suffering, and death. When we choose to rebel against God, that is a horrendous decision, a tragic decision. For when we rebel against God, that opens the floodgates to suffering, disaster, destruction, and death. Secondly, when you read the book of Job, you'll begin to realize the Bible insists life is unfair, God is fair. Don't get the two mixed up. Job suffered unfairly, but Job did not clench his fist and wave it in God's face because, God under, because Job understood God is fair. Job also understood life is very unfair. Life throws screwballs right into your face and into mine. And Job held tightly to the goodness of God's character. He trusted in God. That is a wise decision. When life hurts you, don't make the mistake of blaming God for what life has done to you. And thirdly, when you read the New Testament, you'll begin to understand God is a suffering God. When I stand in front of a statue of Buddha and watch him sitting there with a little smile on his face, arms and legs crossed, I am unimpressed. When I stand before the cross of Christ in my mind's eye, I am looking at God in human form who suffered, bled, and died on a cross. This is a God who knows suffering, who knows pain, who has experienced death. This is a God who you and I can connect with. Jesus Christ offers the solution to the very real problem of suffering and death. When we put our faith in Him, He commands us to make a difference in this world, to fight against suffering, to fight against evil, to promote life, and to stand against the forces of destruction and death. God is a suffering God, Jesus revealed. This is a God who understands your pain, who has experienced my pain, your loneliness and my loneliness. He understands, and He wants to connect with you and with me. But He calls us to trust Him, to put our faith in Him. That's the only way you can have a relationship, by trusting a person. It's the only way you can have a relationship with God, with Jesus Christ, by trusting in Him. I invite you right now, in the depths of your being, to trust in Jesus Christ. Ask Him to forgive you for your wrongdoing. Receive His forgiveness. Put your faith in Him, which means, Jesus, I trust that when you bled and died on the cross, you did it for me, to take the hit, to pay the penalty that I deserve for my wrongdoing. I'm trusting you, Jesus Christ, and you alone for heaven. And when you make that decision, Christ promises to forgive you. He promises to give you eternal life, and He promises to put His Holy Spirit in you, to give you the power to live a new life, a life of loving and obeying Him, even in the midst of suffering but having hope. The hope of Jesus Christ is the deep conviction that there will be a day of judgment, evil will be destroyed, suffering will be wiped away, and eternal life in heaven will be given you by Jesus Christ. And we read about heaven in Revelation 21.4. We read there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Isn't it time for you to accept Christ's solution to the very real problem of suffering? Put your faith in Him and receive His solution, forgiveness, His Holy Spirit today, His presence today, and the gift of eternal life forever. God bless you as you make that most important decision. I'm the pastor of Grace Community Church. We meet every Sunday morning, 930 at Saks Middle School in New Canaan, Connecticut. Simply take the Merritt Parkway to exit 37, go to the end of the ramp, take a left onto Route 124, go approximately one mile, and take a right into Saks Middle School. Won't you join us this Sunday, 930, Saks Middle School, New Canaan, Connecticut. Thanks for joining us for these few minutes. Have a great day.